So uh, thank you all for, uh, for your interest in education. Thank you, Anthem, for, uh, for your good steward stewardship. Uh, thank you, Deborah Mosner, for your leadership of this organization and this great summit. I, I was sorry I couldn't stay longer. You have, you've pretty much covered the waterfront. And I want to really say a special thanks to my friend Dave Adkison, who is really a treasure to this organization. And we're so bullish on Dave Adkison that, as you all know, he's on the U.S. Chamber Board and chairs the Education and Workforce Committee uh, for the U.S. Chamber, which is the Policy Development Committee. So all roads lead to Dave Atkinson around the U.S. Chamber, and you're really, really very fortunate to have a, a leader like him in this organization. Uh, so thank you, Dave, for all, the, all you do uh, to represent business. <clears throat> It's great to be back in the South. I grew up in Texas, and uh, we'll maybe get into a little politics too, but it's, it's really nice to be in a place to, where you can talk about a horse race without someone thinking that you're talking about the Republican primary, although that certainly is one. Uh, but Kentucky is a great and beautiful state. I've spent a good bit of time here. I have an aunt uh, and uncle who lived here for a long time and made a lot of trips to, to Louisville, and lots of Texans have horses here too. Uh, but you all have produced some great leaders throughout history. Uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Boone, Mitch McConnell, and of course Tubby Smith, and I guess I should mention Rick Pitino just to be safe. Uh, but I'm really honored to be invited to speak to you all today in that spirit of teamwork and togetherness that informs your work. And that's exactly what it's going to take to improve learning here in Kentucky and indeed all across our country. Every single person in this room, whether you're a parent or a grandparent or a citizen or an employer or what, whoever you are, has a stake in our education system. And we all have something to offer. And we all have a responsibility, particularly those of us who are unvested in this system, uh, to insist at our rightful place at the table when it comes to talking about school reform. We cannot view education as a zero-sum game, like we're seeing so often play out in politics. Uh, that mindset really will get us nowhere, and if you've been reading the news, uh, you'll note, probably with interest, that the media is reporting that teachers' unions are furious with the Obama administration and my successor, Secretary Arne Duncan, uh, because, as Newsweek has said, the administration has been speeding up the pace of reform, and the unions are worried that it will put the adults in the system, teachers, administrators, and others, under the microscope. So some really interesting, uh, strange bedfellows in politics show up in education. But we should not and cannot be afraid of, uh, of reform and change in education. In fact, if we don't, uh, we are, as we Texans would say, in a world of hurt. Uh, as we all know, our schools are not producing enough graduates that are skilled and able to be competitive in, in the workplace or to be successful in college. Uh, we have dropout factories that continue to manufacture misery. And I think it's a stunning statistic that only 13% of our schools produce about half of our nation's dropouts or that we fear alternatives like charter schools, I know that's an issue you all have struggled with, that remain out of reach because of opposition and red tape and various other reasons. So these things really should keep us up at night because they're so integral to our own future, not only as business people and individuals, but clearly our country as well. And let me tell you something, as I've traveled really the country and the world, a lot of teachers and principals that I know agree with this. They get that we cannot continue to do what we've been doing. So the answer is not to shrink from the battle, to turn away, but to join together and fight for our children. And so I'm extremely proud of the work that we at the U.S. Chamber are doing to advance reform. My friend Tom Donahue has the right idea. He says we need to step on the gas pedal reform, not slam on the brakes, he adds that the continued viability of the American dream is at stake. And if the business community is not, as I like to say, at the point of the spear, vigorously involved in insisting on better, better uh, in, uh, quality of education, uh, we are in trouble. I also want to applaud the work that you all do here in Kentucky on this subject. Your new agenda of great ideas is terrific, and it promises to give students more choices and more chances at the American dream. There's not a single person in this room 
that is here because they didn't have some kind of education to help get them here. The current fight in D.C. right now is over the reauthorization, the renewal of the No Child Left Behind Act, which I actually sometimes think of as my third child. Uh, it was originally called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and <clears throat> if you walked out on that street corner today, just outside, if you dare do that on this dreadfully hot day, and you ask people if they've heard of No Child Left Behind, they would say they have. Uh, they probably had not have heard of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, but it, it really has been a, an, a, an important game changer. Um, we believe at the Chamber that the new law Yes, the law should be reauthorized and renewed and perfected and tweaked, but it should be preserved and strengthened so that we can take this to the next level. It should contain rigorous accountability provisions that are clear, transparent, and cover all students and all schools. I want to elaborate on that a little more, but we cannot just segment part of our kids getting a high quality education and forget the rest. Second, it has to provide real choices for students and parents through access to tutoring, charter schools, and school choice. And third, it has to recognize that the most important thing we can do is have an effective teacher and effective leaders in our schools. As the Chamber says, we can't turn back the clock to the days when billions of federal dollars were spent without any expectations for student results for taxpayer investments. Now, I'm no stranger to the arguments against this law. As Education Secretary, I got it from all sides, and it helps to know kind of where we came from and how we got here. When our founding fathers wrote the Constitution, they listed the few tasks that the federal government was allowed to do. And you'll hear this even repeated today. It's this constant recalibrating of the, of the state and federal role in so many areas of government, including education. The Tenth Amendment reserved the rest of the functions to the states, to the people, and that, of course, included public education. For nearly 200 years, this wisdom and foresight really created the best education system in the world. We, as Americans, strove to do something that really no nation had ever, had ever tried to do, and frankly, probably still has not done, and that is offer every single person the chance at an education. Our public schools produced great leaders and good citizens. They taught and assimilated millions of immigrants. Their graduates powered our economy and built the American century. And following Brown versus the Board of Education, everyone got a shot at the American dream. Then something happened. Slowly but surely, we stopped paying attention. Standards started to fall. Many of our best women teachers left the classroom. An achievement gap between white and black and rich and poor was allowed to grow and a rising tide of mediocrity threatened to swamp us all. I do not exaggerate when I say that we faced a dire situation. In 1998, two-thirds of all fourth graders in high poverty schools could not read at the most basic level. Think about that. Math was just as bad. In 03, American high school students ranked 28th out of 40 nations but we led the world in grade inflation. 72% of our kids said they got good grades in math compared to 25% of students in top-ranked Hong Kong. Millions of families wanting a quality education for their sons and daughters, and I bet some of you fall in this category, and rightly so, voted with your feet. You moved to neighborhoods with better public schools or you left them entirely for private schools while whole populations and segments of our, our, of our country were literally left behind. How did we get in this place, and why? I don't know if many of you are fans of Seinfeld, but there's an episode where George Costanza breaks up with his girlfriend, and he says, it's not you, it's me. So let me say it wasn't you. It wasn't us in the business community particularly. It was this education bureaucracy that grew up the, in, in the name of really supporting itself. In Washington, uh, we call this cast of characters lovingly, and, and everyone does it, the blob. And I'm talking about the, the people who represent employee groups uh, in the system. And they claim to represent kids, of course, but really they're paid to represent the needs of adults. As former American Federation of Teachers head Al Shanker once said, when school children start paying union dues, that's when I'll start representing the interests of school children. You've probably heard that quote before. 
These players exercised and still do tremendous influence, not only on the halls of Congress, but also in the halls of state capitals and local municipal buildings. They fund one another through union dues, earmarks, and campaign contributions, and business has boomed. The huge marbled National Education Association headquarters was not built by selling candy bars. The number of federal, state, and local mandates skyrocketed, many of which had little to do with actual classroom learning and the needs of kids. As for accountability for student learning, and I'm quoting from a, a, a manifesto from one of the unions, the association believes there should be no single or statewide accountability system. So it was a cozy system for the adults, but how was it doing for kids? Not so much. That's when, in 1983, the Nation at Risk report came, up, came out and really issued this clarion call to, to all of us. And I think it was shocking, really. So states, governors in particular, started to act. Uh, they had uh, the National Governors Association called for higher standards, accountability, less regulation, and they pushed this effort of uh, raising standards for all students. And a lot of them were successful. So by the start of the new millennium, about two-thirds of entering ninth graders were graduating on time. The rest dropped out and fell through the cracks, sometimes onto the streets. But that's why we still know there's work to do. So in 01, when President Bush and I showed up, uh, we began to work with the late Senator Ted Kennedy and uh, then Congressman, plain old Congressman John Boehner, who's now famous and infamous, um, it, to create this new culture and new focus around education. This law passed by amazing bipartisan margins, 87 to 10 in the Senate. I was at the White House for four years as the domestic policy advisor, and I can't think of anything else that passed with that kind of support. And it's hard to think even just a few years, 10 years later, that you know, almost nothing in Washington gets done with this kind of bipartisan support, and that's worrisome too. No Child Left Behind, the law that's on the books, is really not that complicated. It simply says that what we're supposed to do in the schools is get kids reading and ciphering on grade level. It asks states to set standards, not the federal government, and it has consequences when states and students don't meet those. It doesn't use the word failing, but a lot of people think that it has over-labeled failure in our public schools and has stigmatized some of them. But I would remind these folks that uh, that stigma is, is much uh, less bad than the stigma that our young people face when they lack the skills necessary to be productive and effective in life and in society and in the workplace. So it's easy to set goals, and I know the people in this room care about results. President Obama, to his great credit, has recognized the real academic gains that have been achieved under the law. African American and Hispanic students have made particular, particularly good progress. Fourth grade reading scores for English language learners were up eight points from 04 to, eight, uh, to 08. Students with disabilities up five points. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it represents a lot of kids that now have better skills. It's also improved data gathering, information uh, which we have to better manage this enterprise, which frankly prior to NCLB left a lot to be desired. How can we solve these problems when we don't know where they are and, and who's affected and what subject areas and so forth? When poor performance is caught, we can attend to it and we catch it by testing students, by collecting data, and by disaggregating and reporting it and holding ourselves accountable for the, for the results of every single student. This transparency has been a game changer and it's made a lot of people uncomfortable. States now do a much better job of getting this information out to the public. A friend of mine who writes a, a famous education blog called EduWonk uh, wrote recently that we finally have better numbers because states are starting to count actual students. That's why I disagree with those who say that reform has undermined federalism or violates states' rights. You're going to hear a lot of this over the next year as this law is debated. The truth is states are now doing more to teach and test and monitor progress than ever before. And you can see it here in Kentucky, which you, which you uh, have adopted the rigorous common core curriculum in English and math, really ramping up the level of expectations for your students. And I don't think this would have happened without the bright sunshine of this law. 
The Commonwealth also has a longitudinal data system that includes all 10 core elements uh, recommended by the data quality campaign. That's wonkery for you're doing it right. And uh, it's, you're continually working to improve the kind of information systems that you have. But you can't be complacent. None of us can. Uh, sometimes the rhetoric outpaces the reality in schools. At the 2005 National Governors Association Summit, Bill Gates came and put it on all the governors about the dropout rate, and all 50 governors signed up for the pledge that said, we mean it, we're going to really address the dropout problem. Three years later, only nine had actually done anything. And so in 2008, we had a regulation that started talking about, you know, how we were going to hold ourselves more accountable for high school dropouts. The bottom line now is that states are leading the way in K-12 education. You see it around the country. And politicians now have no choice but to follow. The rising tide is in favor of high standards and accountability. States like Wisconsin and Ohio are reconsidering teacher tenure laws that value incumbency and seniority above all. Even the U.S. Conference of Mayors, big city mayors, has recently endorsed reforming teacher tenure. Now, I realize that some changes will be made to No Child Left Behind. They should be. We've learned a lot in 10 years. And our proposal, the Chamber's proposal, gives states more flexibility to design their own accountability systems around a new approach. No Child Left Behind is a pass-fail system. And that doesn't d distinguish enough who's doing really well and who's chronically underperforming. So we aim to have states make those discernments more precisely. But I also believe as we look at changes, we also have to uphold some core principles. We must require annual assessments, continue to, and disaggregate this data so we knew, know where each and every child is, who's fallen behind and where. And we have to have real teeth and consequences so that when, when underperformance continues, we can actually do something about it. And we should act quickly. The longer we delay, the more pressure builds to hollow out reform and apply grease to the squeaky wheels uh, through less transparent avenues like waivers from the federal government. During my tenure as secretary, I received countless requests for waivers. One of my favorites was from Utah. Every single year they showed up and they asked for a waiver that says, please let us only educate 80% of our students. We don't want to have to educate all of them. And Kentucky asked very frequently to hold state schools accountable, not every year, but every other year. Those uh, requests were rejected. We in the business community are not asking for too much to have our kids read and cipher at grade level. That's what you want for your children and grandchildren. Why would we think anyone wants less for theirs? The law gave states a 12-year window in which to comply, and the states themselves, not the feds, set the targets, as it should be. States pay most of the education bills, as I need not tell you, and it's in their interest, in state interest, to see the best return on your investment. And Kentucky has done a really commendable job with this. You've earned a, a grade of B, uh, ranking 17th of getting as, you know, a good value for your tax dollars in education according to our nation's education report card. I know I speak for the chamber when I say that the conversation in every state should be all about what it takes to educate all students, not on how to ease the pressure for adults. We should be finding for new ways to, to work to address those, those kid needs. And this is especially important in a down economy. The only thing sadder than a person without a job is a person that goes without a job because they lack the skills and education necessary. More than half, 53% of business leaders say their companies face a major challenge in recruiting non-managerial employees with the right school skills, training, and education. And if we don't pick up the pace by 2020, 123 million American jobs will be high skill and high wage, but only 50 million people will be qualified to fill them. Those jobs are going to go somewhere else. We don't have to accept this. We have to hold firm and, and 
uh, make sure that we don't let any retrenchment occur. I know you get frustrated when government sees your business only as a cash cow or a health care provider or a tax collector and not what it really is, a producer of goods and services that people want and places that provide jobs. Likewise, a public school is not a haven for public sector employees uh, for, to have employment and health care and rich pensions. It is a place that is about our kids. I sometimes hear talk in Washington around the, the new normal, that we're in a post-American era, that we have to accept that the Chinese and the Indians and others are going to eat our lunch because the world's flat now, right? Well, we made it flat. American innovation made it flat. And if you ask me, there wasn't much wrong with the old normal when we educated the, our young people to beat the pants off of everybody else. Forty-two years ago next week, American astronauts left the bonds of Earth and stepped onto the moon. They were powered by computers that wouldn't hold a candle to the one that's in your pocket or your purse. Let me tell you something, America's normal is better than 99% of the world's best. And we are not cutting corners by, by at not competing. H Kentuckian Henry Clay said, of all human powers operating on the affairs of mankind, none is greater than competition. And I believe that, and I know you do too. So let's work together to give the next generation the knowledge and skills to compete and win in the next American century. Thank you very much.